Uh, Dr. Clayton Scrabeck, who's from the University of Findlay in Ohio, but who writes all sorts of stuff about Pittsburgh, is going to talk about the uh, steel and electrical men of Pittsburgh. That was his title. So all the, the big rich guys, we're going to hear their stories come out of some of his books. In January, I had announced that Pamela's was going to talk, and they had a death in the family and not their work. But many of you know this is an anniversary of Brother Shalom, and the rabbi, Rabbi Young, has agreed to come and talk about Brother Shalom, and also, which is really a shady side, but it's such an institution here that we want to hear from them, and also to talk about some of the history of the reform movement in this country because Brother Shalom had a lot to do with that. You may have seen an announcement in the paper about a uh, memorial unveiled in, in the North Hills of something called the, uh, the, the, the Pittsburgh Compact, or uh, it was a platform. Pardon me? Platform. platform, which is a key step in Reform Judaism that came out here, and we'll get into that. In February, uh, speaker who's come many times, Elizabeth Rourke, who helped provide most of the pictures for our book, uh, will speak at this time on Chatham University. Uh, in March, we doing something I wanted to do for a long time. We're going to take a look at the history of the fire department. And then in April, the gentleman who works down at the Allegheny County Jail in the historic operation He's going to talk about the jail and Henry Richardson, the, the famous architect. So I think we got a nice, varied program. We'll announce the rest of the year shortly. Um, we're a volunteer organization. Our meetings are open. You don't have to be a member, but we do have membership forms in the back, and we'd we'll love to have you as a member for a nominal fee. And uh, we welcome you, and I think. It's right around the time. Our speaker tonight is Joel A. Tarr, who is the Richard Calvary University Professor of History and Political Science and Policy, and policy in, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we had a little problem this week. Uh, Monday morning, lo and behold, the Post Gazette announced that Richard Calajari was speaking to him. <laughs> 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 we, we didn't think we had that kind of power. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Joel, Joel has written many things, but one of the recent works he's been focusing on is the role of horses in Pittsburgh. And uh, we're glad to have him come and talk to us tonight. Thank you. My I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Before Joel speaks, Esther Tucker has a poem to read. She's one of the charter members of this group, and you'll understand how this all fits together. I'm sorry you had to remind me. This was written several months ago. Uh, it was in the Post Gazette in March. Thank you. <laughs> the horse trot. I remember horses on Beechel Boulevard. Horses trotting, young girls laughing in the saddle. Horses plodding, pulling bread trucks, milk carts, stopping to drink at the stone trough across from the cemetery. Fresh water, always sparkling, filled the trough to refresh the young horses, the old horses, trotting, plodding down Beecher Boulevard. The horses are gone. No water fills the old truck now. But in summer, caring people plant flowers there, flowers to refresh the heart. I once bloomed with youth, gave nourishment, laughed sparkling with my children long ago. But still I think there are flowers in my heart to refresh a little people around me. And sometimes on Beecher Boulevard, I hear hoofbeats, stopping for the sparkling water in the old stone truck. I didn't notice the podium was in music. Um, I want to thank you, Rustin. That was lovely. I read it before. Um, 
I um, published a book this um, June uh, with a co-author called Horses and Cities. Horses and Cities. Um, living machines in um, living machines in the nineteenth century. And um, I, I think I might I think I need the light um, to read my notes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then after I got to publish the book, I looked at the amount of material I had on Pittsburgh. And in the book, we looked at New York City, Boston, and Pittsburgh, as well as two other cities. I said, my goodness, I have enough here for practically a separate monograph from Pittsburgh um, without necessarily um, um, and, you know, taking, duplicating too much that was in the book. So I began to put some. Um, Things together. I, first of all, I was planning an article for the um, Pittsburgh History magazine. Um, but I, I've been talking to Esther for a while. I asked Esther to kind of get her to come and talk about um, the history of Squirrel Hill here for quite a while. And I said, Esther, I, don't, I lived here for 40 years, but I don't know very much about Squirrel Hill. I mean, I, in historical depth, I've done some work on specialized work in transportation, maybe, but not too much else. But when she asked me again, I said, well, Perhaps what I could do is come and talk to your group about horses in Pittsburgh. And uh, not Squirrel Hill specific, but, um, but Pittsburgh specific. <coughs> now, um, what, what, what I'm going to do is I have about 40 slides. And I'm not going to, I'm going to mingle the slides a little bit with my talk, but the slides will not necessarily uh, exactly correspond uh, to the words things I'm going to be talking about. So um, I may, I'll probably jump around a little bit. The thing I think that we I think we have to realize is that the horse in the city, and how many horses were there in the cities, by the way? Well, I, probably a maximum of about three and a half million horses in American cities, about 1900. And that's out of a total of about 21 million horses. Because the very majority of horses were on the farms. Um, how many horses did Pittsburgh have? Well, I calculated about 14,000. Um, in 1900, that was probably about its maximum, 14,000 or so. It was hard to tell always <coughs> um, exactly how many there were because by 1900, many of the horse cars are gone. But let's say it's around 14, um, around 14,000. Now, one of the things that I think that um, we have to realize is that while we like to romanticize the horse, and we've talked about um, um, wonderful horse trails in Chimney Park, and we talked about um, Seagate and all Black Beauty and all these other things. They were the exception. Really, the great mass of horses were working horses. They were really what I call living machines. That is, they served the same function to the society and to the cities and in the rural areas also as machines did, as a power source. And one 18th century authority on Horses said this, he said, he sought to discover the animal which was the best machine for turning food into money. That's basically what horses were doing, were turning food into money in different, in different ways. That's true, of course, that horses were also valued for their uses in leisure activities, such as riding and racing. And there's some, if you look at some of the 19th century memoirs of Pittsburgh figures, you find they often, um, talk about exploring the city and the region by horseback and about the wonderful scenes that they saw uh, when they did that. There's no doubt that the elite kept and enjoyed fancy horses, and parading is one horse in the <coughs> park, as I said, was a very popular activity at the turn of the century. And we had uh, different clubs that were involved with them um, um, using horses and parading horses, I think that's the right way to express it such as the Shenley Matinee Club or the Crafton Club, very popular clubs among the elite. But as I said, the great mass of horses were working horses, engaged in a whole range of intra-city activities. Obviously, they pulled omnibuses and horse cars, they hauled heavy freight and household goods or drays and wagons, and they powered machines and equipment of various kinds. And when we look at Pittsburgh, and I'd, I'd like to start off with this, Slide, this image. Uh, what we see here is these one horse and two horse drays or wagons are carrying goods from the Monongahela Walk to various parts uh, in the town. 
And very early on, you find in the various chronicles that are written, such as Harris's directive of 1837, comments of a great number of cost one drays and, and wagons that move goods around the city <coughs> from the Monongahela Wharf to the canal basin and back and forth. In 1837, Harris noted that there were 180 licenses, licenses, that they had a licensure horse and wagon taken out for drays, wagons, and carts. There probably were another hundred or so that were unlicensed. Now, many of the draymen, what a dray is, is a one horse vehicle, basically. I actually have a <coughs> one. Let's just see if I can sort of synchronize this as we go along. Yeah, this is great. A one horse vehicle. Many of the draymen were independent owners. Uh, they owned um, the other own um, <coughs> wagon, and they were um, very proud of their activities. In 1880, the census recorded over 1,100 draymen, hackmen, and teamsters in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and in Pittsburgh, in, for much of the 19th century, they often paraded on festival days uh, in white smocks, standing on their vehicles um, as they, they highlighted the labor parades. It was, kind of, it was a craft that people took great pride in. Not only in Pittsburgh, it was true in other cities also, though. Now, increasingly, however, the independent draymen many of whom, as they said, were individual owners, disappeared. In the late 19th century, large firms that employed teamsters and operated many wagons, and many of them were not one-horse wagons, took over. So initially, initially uh, most of the drivers were Irish, um, had Irish backgrounds, and, and many teamsters were Irish also. But increasingly towards 1900, uh, African Americans acquired jobs as drivers, whereas uh, teamsters. And by 1911, African Americans composed about half of the city's teamsters. Many of them worked for large companies, though. They did not um, own their own um, horses or wagons. Now, another thing that horses did was that they furnished stationary power. Well, these, are, these, are, these are pictures of somebody. I'm not going to show you these. These are pictures of, I mean, look, look at this downtown street, the line with um, horse drawn um, wagons. <clears throat> about in the 1890s. Um, and of course, horses did all kinds of things. The mail. Um, if you can't read that, but there's an ice cream wagon on the left. Um, pure distilled water sold in the streets. These are all Pittsburgh pictures. I'll tell you when it appears it isn't. Um, um, three horse team. This is an ambulance, a picture, not a photograph. This is not a photograph of a Pittsburgh uh, horse-drawn ambulance, but I'm sure there are some in the archives of the hospital. And then this is one of the really interesting pictures. This is the um, 22 horse team that took the um, the um, mausoleum of um, high of um, the heights of um, Henry Frick, um, um, to the cemetery um, when he passed away. And what I think is an amazing picture, not only because they have 22 horse teams, it's very hard to find pictures that show you um, a lot of horses pulling um, teams, a lot of teams, large teams such as five or eight or ten horses or twelve. But if you look at the literature, you find a lot of comments that these very large teams were quite common in the city of Pittsburgh, particularly around the steel mills and the iron mills. They pulled all these heavy goods on the sites and between the sites. I suspect again there may be some pictures in um, the archives of, a, um, of some of the uh, steel companies or iron steel companies, but I haven't been able to find them. Haven't been able to find them. Um, as I said, they put a stationary power. The one thing they often did, uh, <coughs> obviously a fire, um, which they put in fire, the fire and police services too, of course. This is the Eagle Fire Company, a volunteer fire company from the 1840s, and this is a craft and um, fire company a little later, bigger, but um, obviously a bigger um, wagon, a bigger piece of equipment. <clears throat> now, okay, this is the picture I was looking for. This is really, I think it's an amazing picture, but frankly, it's not a Pittsburgh picture, though. It's a San Francisco picture. It used to be the dust jacket of my book. I have that picture of the dust jacket. But these horses were operating what was called a horse whim, and they were coming to power. Um, to move that house in San, uh, San Francisco, in, in, in San Francisco. Now there is a picture 
somewhat similar to this, but not as impressive, of removing the Heinz house uh, from one place uh, to another in about 1900. I saw it at one time. I've not been able to find it. If any of you know where that picture is, um, you, uh, you might tell me. It's not in, um, in the historic Pittsburgh collection. It doesn't seem to be at the Historical Society either. But the, the point of that I'm talking about here is that the power of a capstan, you know, to furnish power, to move things around the city is very common. But capstans are also used to um, <clears throat> operate hoists of various kinds. They're very commonly horse-powered uh, cap, capstans or, or rims, as they were also called. They were used um, on the docks. They were used in warehouses um, to move things. You have to think of the horses having some of the characteristics of the small electric motor and they moved around easily from place to place, as opposed to the steam engine, which is very big and clumsy. So horses furnish a kind of mobile power that can be transferred throughout the city and can be put to use. Another thing that way that horses were used to furnish power was the horse ferry. <clears throat> this is not a Pittsburgh picture, unfortunately. And I don't think we have a picture of a Pittsburgh horse ferry. But there were horse ferries here. Um, there were probably at least four horse ferries in existence before um, the Civil War. Um, I found in the 1837 directory that a Mr. N. Whitfield, a Birmingham tavern owner and coal merchant, operated a horse ferry from the south side uh, to Pittsburgh. And Jones Ferry, which is a very famous Pittsburgh ferry, began ferrying passengers from Liberty Avenue to the south bank of the Monongahela River in 1813. In the beginning, they propelled the, the ferry using human power, or using oars or poles. Um, but in 1840, they replaced the human power with horsepower. And you, they used horsepower uh, with two blind horses driving a horizontal treadmill. And I, we do have a lot of them, <coughs> pictures of these horses on um, driving treadmills in other cities and other places. There's actually a book that came out several years ago on just on horse ferries. Um, and, um, uh, and it, it was a very, as he said, a very common kind of thing. It lasted well in some places well into the 20th century. Um, <coughs> so they're very common in, in, in river cities. Now one of the things, as you all know, is if you live in the city and you like growing your own food, you have to have food. And of course, fuel, food was fuel for the horse. You had to turn that horse power into money. And they required uh, <clears throat> large amounts of food, obviously, you can imagine 14,000 uh, horses in the city, how much food they required. They largely ate hay and oats. Hay and oats. Now, some owners tried to feed corn to their horses, because it was cheaper. But what happened was that um, um, the, the horses did not operate very well in the corn, and that's because they didn't give the niacin that they needed uh, for their energy. Now, think about hay. So some of you probably been on hay rides and you've seen um, hay growing and carted around and so on. And you realize it's a very bulky material. It's a very bulky material. It's very difficult to transport economically for long distances. And what does that mean? It means that you're going to find cities surrounded, you know, cities have large numbers of horses, they're dependent upon the horses, and they're going to be surrounded by hay fields. Many, many farmers grew hay fields, grew hay, I'm sorry, oats, on the outside of the city. And um, so that the hay that feeds the Pittsburgh horses, for instance, is initially grown on farms in Allegheny, Washington, and Westmoreland County. I have the actual statistics of how much hay is being grown there, not necessarily um, uh, how much went into the city, but we do know how many horses were there um, um, in, the, in the counties. We can work that out. Now, so that the, the, the farmer who was growing hay would cut the hay, load it on his hay wagon, horse to it, of course, and move it into the city. Where would he take it? He would take it to a hay market. A hay market. Where were the hay markets located? One hay market was located on Fifth Avenue or Liberty Avenue in downtown Pittsburgh. Another one was located at Hay Market Square. Where was Hay Market Square? In Allegheny City, directly across from the Allegheny City Market House. So it, you, and there were other places in the city also we were going to see um, hay is going to be um, sold. Let's see what I have here in the next picture. Um, well, this obviously horse needs horseshoes and nails and so on. Um, 
This is a horse story establishment on the big old Liberty Avenue. Um, yeah, Liberty Avenue. Um, Liberty Avenue. Yeah, Liberty Avenue. Liberty Avenue. Yeah, Liberty Avenue. Okay, I'll get to this in a second. Okay, now, so, so let's take a look at the question of feeding the horses, though, and um, um, the way the hay market operated. Um, city ordinances regulated the sale of commodities such as hay. And at the markets, you would have an official weigher, hay's title is actually city weigher, whose scales are regularly tested by the city sealer of weights. And measures, uh, weight, seal, a city seal of weights and measures who weigh the products for and for sale, just to make sure the scales were accurate. And so you have here this lot of hay coming into the surrounding farms, so weighed at the market, priced at the market, according to a city ordinance of some kind, and then sold um, to um, both people that had individual horses, to livery, um, those who owned livery stables. Um, and other kinds of horse uses. <coughs> now, hay nuts were also um, distributed, however, through so-called feed stores. It wasn't only really the big market, there were also many feed stores. And as the number of horses used for freight transportation increased, the number of stores grew, feed stores grew. One of the interesting things we found was that as the nation's railroads grew, and we had more and more um, rail transportation, you know, rail transportation is primarily intercity, not intercity. Um, the demand and need for horses within the city itself increased tremendously. Because once you got the freight you were carrying from whatever from wherever it was to your um, uh, to your city, to your freight station or whatever, it had to be moved around the city. How did you move it? You moved it with a horse-drawn vehicle, a horse-drawn wagon. So that meant that um, <coughs> It seems almost counterintuitive, doesn't it, that as the country becomes more and more dependent upon steam and steam engines, it also needs more horses, but it was certainly true. So, um, in 1857, um, the Pittsburgh Chronicler, the George H. Thurston, who wrote a number of wonderful books on Pittsburgh, wrote, and I quote, The sales of hay, corn, chop stuffs, and such articles of horse and cow feed, consequent upon the great number of graves here, have given rise to a number of establishments called feed stores. And what um, Thurston in 1857 listed nine principal feed stores that handled about half the city's trade, retail trade in hay, oats, and other feed stuff. By 1876, Pittsburgh's population had grown a great deal, it was about 150,000 people. It had 64 flour, grain, and feed establishments. And 20 years after that, in 1896, the city had 67 retail flour, grain, and feed establishments and 18 wholesale establishments. You see, what you have here is a great growth of, this, um, these, these, of these businesses, the principal function of which is to provide for um, food um, and goods for horses. Now, one of the things we find is that the retail businesses, the feed businesses, were often scattered around the city, throughout the city in various um, business districts and so on. But the wholesale establishments, um, which um, increasingly took their pay off of railroads, were concentrated in the Strip District, along Liberty Avenue, adjacent to the tracks of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And that's because, while well, in the beginning, Ukraine was brought in from the surrounding countryside by farmers, um, increasingly it was going to be brought into the city by railroads, and increasingly it was going to be brought in from growing areas in the Middle West. Now, what made that possible? What made that possible, really, is the development of a device called the hay press. Because hay was a very, very, very bulky good. And um, it was very, very expensive to ship hay, and that's what it's supposed to pack. And it was not until somebody invented the hay press, really basically upon the idea of the cotton press, as far as we can tell, that, um, that the cost of transporting hay from the great hay growing areas of states like Illinois and Iowa and so on, um, went down. And then you find that the markets around the city who have been growing hay and oats, I'm sorry, the farmers around the city growing hay and oats, they increasingly cut down uh, upon the amount of hay and their oats as they invested in and grew. Now, what do they, what do they replace it with? To a large extent, they replaced it with garden crops of various kinds. Dairy became quite popular. So that we find the city now surrounded not by a ring of 
font of going hey and going out, but, um, but rather they're going various other kinds of goods that are going to be sold in the city. And they cannot necessarily be transported for long distances at that time. But the growing of hay, the sale of hay in the city was very big business. In 1882, the Pittsburgh Grain and Flour Exchange is organized. And it handles basically the sale of oats and hay and flour and coal lots. In 1894, the exchange carried through a transfer of over almost 8,000 cars of hay and over 3,000 cars of oats from railroads to local buyers. And um, as they increase the amount of hay that processes in this fashion, as they said, the sale of local hay diminishes. Now, the presence, obviously, of a large urban horse population stimulates the growth of a large number of businesses and industries. And these businesses, the businesses and industries that are growing, that are growing in, the, in, the, in the city are both oriented towards the local market, but also oriented towards the export. And it, it, as you know, Pittsburgh was a great iron and steel um, uh, center, and an awful lot of the goods that they used um, were iron and steel. Let me just see if I can give you a couple of pictures. Let's go beyond this for a second. This is a hay press, a picture of a hay press. And this is a hay market, not a Pittsburgh hay market, unfortunately. It's a Chicago hay market. But that was on the Pittsburgh, on the post line. But you can imagine that the Pittsburgh hay markets looked something like this, although not as large. And of course, well, we did have a lot of labor problems. We didn't have a hay market riot. I'm going to confuse you things a bit. Um, I'm just going to go back, if you don't mind. I'm going to show this, I'll show this separately, if you don't mind. We're just finished what I'm talking about here. Um, I should have tried to synchronize this better, but I, the, the, well, the slides I had didn't necessarily fit the outline of what I wanted to talk about. But I was talking about horse-related businesses. And the horse-related businesses are very, very extensive. As I said, some also just for the local market and some for the export market. In 1880, for instance, there were 29 carriage makers in the city. 32 wagon makers, 49 horseshoers, and three express companies. Plus, there were retail stores that provided showrooms for various kinds of horse fulfilled devices. Yes? I just want to point out, that's, that's Homewood Avenue. That's Homewood and County down in Homewood. Oh, yeah. This one right here? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. There might be somebody in the room. Yeah, I don't necessarily, I, I can identify some of these places. Yeah, some of them are cool. not identified in the, um, uh, the picture of this one. I think that's from 1908. Yeah. Oh, I, got, I think I got this one there. I may have gotten it off of the start of Pittsburgh. But um, it's about that, that time period. Yeah, I'm not very good for them to mark it down, but what to be marked down. Um, let me go over the horse business as well. In 1892, when Pittsburgh had a population of about 240,000 people, there were 56 harness makers, 81 farriers, and 17 carriage manufacturers. By 1900, it had 23 carriage and wagon manufacturers and 32 firms engaged in just making saddles and harness products. So there's a very, very big business here. Plus, an awful lot of people. And as I said, the local market, but also the export market. There were many, many blacksmiths. Blacksmiths tended to be scattered throughout the city, as you might expect. I showed you that earlier picture of a, of a, um, a blacksmith shop on the, in Bloomfield. Uh, but there were also Three whip makers, for instance. Two packages, three makers, three whip, three packages that made whips. There were horse blanket makers. There were just a huge variety of things, horse rakes, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, as we said, this, you have to think of it in terms of the automobile. Think of all the way, all the various activities, retail activities and wholesale activities, um, stations, gasoline stations, and so on repair stations supported by the automobile. And just put the horse in that um, equation rather than the automobile. And you can see the way in which it was a really a generating kind of factor um, for the urban um, economy. And they also needed other things too, of course. They needed troughs, water troughs, they needed hitching posts. And also the paving of streets with cobblestones, in many cases, was driven by the need to provide 
secure footing of the horses. Okay, now, um, stables. Horses needed food, they also needed some place to live. They had to be housed. And um, we looked at the number of stables per population in for several cities, and the city that had the most horses per stable in the nation was Boston. It was in 1900 at 7.8 horses per stable. New York had 6.7. Pittsburgh was very close to that. They had 4.8 horses per stable. Now, there are small stables scattered all over the city. Um, and some of them are very fancy, and some of them are fancy at all, of course. Um, but the largest stables, and the largest stables, by the way, were those of the streetcar companies, or horse companies, were located largely in the downtown area, along the river floodplains, um, where the um, where flat, there was flat land where railroads were concentrated, or they were located at the end of the horse car lines. Now, during the 1890s, we began to have building permits during the 1890s, and I was able to figure out how many stables were constructed. In the 1890s, stable construction constituted between 5 and 7% of new buildings in the city. So that's an awful lot of stables that are being constructed. But the city's largest horse car line, I had a picture of it up there before, I don't know if you Right, the city's largest uh, horse barn and horse marking place was in East Liberty. And east of his stockyards and horse exchange. Originally constructed in 1863 by the Pennsylvania Railroad, it covered 25 acres and could accommodate 5,000 horses under a single roof, as well as thousands of hogs, sheep, and cattle. Um, now, over time, the Pennsylvania Railroad begins to move out um, towards the late 18th century, and they eventually moved their cattle facilities to Hare's Island. Of course, you know, Hare's Island was a which was, and so on. But uh, some of the horse selling facilities remained in East Liberty until the early 20th century. There was another large, um, scare sale, large horse sale barn in Pittsburgh on 2nd Avenue, um, the Arnheim Livestock Company. And then there's also a Pittsburgh horse exchange located on <coughs> King Way. Because you can live very big horse dealers or very big automobile, automobile deliveries, if you will. Now, Livery stables, the, what do you compare a livery stable? You compare it to, I guess, an automobile rental agency. But there were more, but even more of them because the number of people that owned their own horses in the city is relatively small. But if you needed a horse, what you did was you went to a livery stable. In 1892, there were 82 livery stables in the city. Um, they were scattered um, in many places throughout the city. And you can read their advertisements in the city directories. Some of the advertisements are very interesting, business directories. For instance, um, um, there was a stable, a livery ex exchange stable um, on, 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 on Penn Avenue, 174 to 184 Penn Avenue, which is downtown. And they said there was, they were classed with the largest in the U.S. and were equipped in a most approved and thorough manner. Or um, a fellow by the name of Mr. Kennedy from Allegheny City operated a 20 horse comfortable stable that supplied plenty of group food and voting, and the best attention is guaranteed by careful and experienced grooms to all horses taken on board. Um, somebody else boasted that their stable was perfectly lighted and drained and ventilated, and so on along the line. But the stables that are the most elaborate in the city, that are really luxurious quarters for horses. Of the stables of the H. J. Hines Company. These are the stables. These are the, the livery stables of 1892. They'll be scattered on to. Oh. <laughs> um, let me make a point about this um, picture. Um, this picture is in your Squirrel Hill book, but I think it's mislabeled. <laughs> um, this is a unique Pittsburgh phenomenon, as far as you can see. That was a combination of livery stables with undertaking establishments. There are many, many, I have the numbers, 
down here um, about that. Um, in, eight, in 1892, the Pittsburgh City Directory listed 82 livery stables. I said that already. 20 also provided undertaking services. And of the 48 undertakings listed, 20 provided livery service. In New York City, they wouldn't allow that. And Boston, they didn't have that either. So here was, it's a, for whatever reason, I don't know what the reason was, but it was a kind of unique kind of phenomenon. This is an East Liberty, an East Liberty livery stable. Um, but you can see the livery stable, and above that, undertaking and involvement. And then the two hearses in, in, in front. Now, as I said, though, the Heinz, um, the Heinz stables are the most elaborate. That's, you know, this is the Heinz stable in the early 20th century on the north side. And as I said, they really worried about taking care of the horses. And here's a, a horse in its stable, in its, um, um, it's in the stable and it's, um, you know, I'm sorry, um, like down, whatever you, you call where, where the horse is. Um, it's a stall. It's a stall. It's in a, it has a footpath. Those stalls were equipped with footpaths. And they were heated also, very, very roomy. So those horses had a very luxurious time with the compared, as you might imagine, the other sources. <laughs> <laughs> and the Pines was very, very proud of their horses. This is a famous prize-winning uh, three-horse team um, that the Heinz Pines really um, utilized and boasted about. Now, I don't know if you saw just a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, there was something in the Post Gazette about the last Heinz horses mm have -hmm. been retired. Um, there was somebody that was actually taking care of that horse, and they were using it in ads and things like that. So they decided to stop it. I don't know why they decided to stop it. But again, here you can see these. These are now, of course, those buildings behind have uh, are, um, condominiums and so on. Um, but the, 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 the famous horse, that famous prize winning horse, threw in vehicles in front. And here is Mr. Colonel Heinz themselves, family of themselves in front of their mansion, um, in their, um, in their Obviously, I'll be an elaborate story. And here's um, Mr. Hines himself on his um, prize winning um, 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 horse. And again, the elite and the wealthy were very conscious of the importance of horses. Uh, they had many beautiful animals. They paid very high prices for them. Um, and they liked to show them off. We have quite a bit in our book about um, horses in Central Park in New York City. With just all kinds of elaborate things, and, and, and people would come out on Sunday and try to um, outdo each other in terms of the elaborateness of their carriages and their horses. Every once in a while, you find a comment in the newspaper that some a butcher would try to take his family in the back of his delivery truck into the Central Park to let them also enjoy the park. And the park authorities were not very happy about that. Um, I mentioned before that. Um, the lead also um, <coughs> were engaged in racing. This is the Finley Oval, um, and where they have them, uh, obviously at Surrey's racing there, the Finley Oval. Um, still, when I came to Pittsburgh in 1967, there were still um, pony rides uh, in Shelby Park up there, and then they had the fire, I guess, in 1970 or 71, and I think the number of horses were killed um, in that. Okay, before I want to talk about this, I want to just go on with a couple of points. Let's stay with the point about fires. Stable fires were ubiquitous. And they were ubiquitous because you had so much material that burned so easily. You hay, you see, materials like that, lanterns and things like that. And um, um, we found in, in the New York City papers, for instance, um, that in about a 30-year period, there were almost 400 stable fires scattered around the city. Um, unfortunately, none of the Pittsburgh papers have been digitized yet, but sure we'll find a lot of fires too. And in 1906, 1907, the Allegheny City Fire Department, in its annual report, reported that stable fires were responsible for a majority of the 360 alarms that they had from Allegheny City, which was a separate um, at that particular time. So that's um, quite, a, um, um, quite a serious, uh, dangerous kind of um, thing. Now, 
Um, forces. As you might expect with all those horses and vehicles in the city, you would have to have regulations of various kinds. And one thing they had, for instance, um, was when you could tie your horse off, there were limit, limitations on where you could park. There were also uh, limitations on speed. Um, and there was also license, licensing of vehicles. I find it very hard to understand how they could enforce the speed regulation. No <laughs> horse could travel more than five miles an hour. How they have known that? But they did have them. They did have regulations. And, they, and so they, um, as I said, a number of things. Uh, for instance, an 1816 ordinance um, forbade the showing of horses in the street. Can you change your tire in the street? I guess you can. You can do that. You couldn't show your horse if you're not got a, a shoe or a shoe in the street. Um, an 1879 ordinance forbade the tying of horses or mules or mules near any tree. Well, why would they do that? You might think you would tie your horse up to the tree. Well, that's because the horses ate the bark of trees. And I have a picture to show you what they could do. Um, later ordinances regulated, and this has a sanitary implication, um, the distance of stables from homes and the collection of manure. Um, and so, you know, um, it may be seem very romantic to be have your home next to a, a, a barn or a stable <laughs> and your own pet um, black beauty. But obviously, horses produce a large amount of manure, on the average of 25 to 35 pounds of manure a day, right. and over a quart of urine. And so, there's many things that raise the concern, sanitary concerns about um, stables. But it was not only the fact that the manure itself uh, smelled uh, at the, in the pre-germ period, pre-germ theory period, um, they actually believed that miasmas, bad smells, can make you sick. So that was one thing, but. Perhaps the worst thing about the piles of horse manure that existed in many places was that they were the breeding ground for flies. And flies are the carriers of many acute kinds of diseases. Whereas, as far as we know, the only disease that's transferable from horse to human is glanders. Glanders. Okay, now, um, I have a figure here somewhere I wanted to. Okay, in 1894, this the Chief Pittsburgh Sanitary Inspector reported 480 manure heaps in violation of the city of <laughs> Now, manure could be a very valuable um, commodity, though, and early on, farmers would come into the city and collect the manure. Um, they would buy it in some cases, too, from the livery stable. But as the city traffic grew and grew, the manure often was ground up, and it wasn't worth very much anymore, and it became just a nuisance more than anything else. Um, another sanity problem that horses posed was that they died, just like any living thing dies. They would die in the street sometimes, though. And then you had a problem about um, removing the horse. Now, much depended upon the, um, the kind of recycling industry you had in your city, and how quickly the dead horse was going to be removed. Because a dead horse was a valuable commodity in itself. You can play with leather, it's hopes and so on. So um, um, uh, in Pittsburgh, you know, you had this back and forth between contractors and so on. Sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't work. Now, all right, let's go back. I keep on getting to the trains and flies. So we're going to show them. By the way, um, I might just tell you um, what these are. These are some pictures from the Pittsburgh um, um, a centennial um, exhibit in the um, early, yeah, in the early 20th century. And the thing that struck me about these pictures is that they show these wonderful horses, obviously, probably um, the displays. But it's the things that they're showing. Here you have a modern blast furnace. It's what we say, modern blast furnace, right there. Right? All its accessories. They can still the most modern one. Well, what's a pull by? It's pulled by horses. It's pulled by the power is being furnished by um, a, um, a, you know, an animal that's been around for thousands of years. There are other pictures in the um, same. Oh, I 
pictures of Manoa. Yeah, this is in New York City Street. They're actually in 1890. And that's big piles of stuff for all for you. And this is the tree, the tree that the tree that the horses had um, dug into, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there you can see the caption, Chester County, so it's a Pennsylvania County. And of course, we had horse um, troughs too, yeah, and you needed to furnish water for horses. But increasingly, the city frowned on the use of horse troughs, and that's been trying to forbid them actually, and that's because horses often got sick from drinking the water. Flanders was a big problem in the garden. Oh, a few dead horses here. This is a New York picture also. And we speculate that that dead horse would not have stayed there for very long. It's a very famous picture because it was worth something. It was a commodity. It's like a dead automobile. You know? I wanted to go and stay on the street. <laughs> and they had special devices for hoisting dead horses into the, uh, uh, into the uh, vehicles. You know, they were going to get, uh, carry them away. The first time I've given this, and I've not really managed to synchronize it very well. form of horse-drawn public vehicle, the public transportation is the so-called omnibus. In the first place, it's developed is in Paris, and then in the early 19th century, omnibuses begin to appear, and omnibus lines begin to appear in cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. The omnibus, the horse-drawn bus, doesn't come to Pittsburgh until the, um, the 1830s. Um, in New York, they had it in 1832, um, Pittsburgh not until the um, in um, the 1840s and 50s. But by the 1850s, the city had four omnibus lines that went from the downtown of the center city to contiguous towns, which are still separate towns, like Lawrenceville, Minersville, and the Hill District, Oakland, and Allegheny City. And because the topography of Pittsburgh is so rough and makes it even doesn't make it very easy to get around, they tended to follow the routes that have been used by early coach lines. Now, the underbuses were usually pulled by four horses, and they seated between 12 and 20 people, and they charged for 12 cents. Um, and the largest line, the Excelsior, ran buses every 10 minutes from its downtown depot in Lo um, to Lawrenceville, on the, along the Allegheny River, about three miles. Other underbuses actually went all the way to East Liberty, following the same route. Now, there was a lot of competition between the underbuses. So much competition that you had uh, in, in the 1850s, the Pittsburgh City Council passed an ordinance um, regulating um, um, conditions in an omnibus depot and requiring the vehicles to stay in a certain spot. So, of course, by this time, the horse car has begun to appear. The horse car really begins in New York City in 1832, but it's not until 1851 that you begin to get extensive horse car uses. I mean, in New York and later on Philadelphia and Boston. Um, Pittsburgh developed a horse car in 1859. What is a horse car? The horse car essentially is a street car. The horses are going to be pulling the, um, um, the cars um, on rail. And um, they follow basically the same routes, the same routes that have been used earlier by the, um, the, the turnpikes or by the omnibuses. Those have really provided the least travel resistance. Um, by 1859, the city council had chartered four streetcar lines, four streetcar lines, and they tended to go in the direction of the towns that I mentioned before. That's the omnibus. This is a picture that's in your book. 
Uh, does anybody know where that was? That looks to I can't make out whether it was an on the bus used for regular transportation of businessmen to their offices or whether it was just an elite vehicle used for special occasions. Anybody know where that was? <coughs> well, anyway, I copied it, so thank you. <laughs> This is this is where the post card is. This is an 1863 picture. It was setting out a new post card. The Pittsburgh post cards tended to be smaller than Philadelphia and New York, and that's because of the hilly topography. You just needed more power to, make, to, to get up those hills. And this, this of course, is going Forbes Avenue towards Oakland. Citizens Passage Line, which is one of the largest in East Liberty. Go to the way by the post. The cobblestone streets. Um, and um, the car the companies themselves are responsible for maintaining the street uh, to a certain distance on the other side of the track. And this is the way the lines worked in 1869. This is the um, 20 some odd miles. 23 miles almost, a horse car line in 1869. And horse cars continued to exist and to grow in length and distance and volume of passengers right through the 1890s when you get cable cars and electricity, electrical cars. And by 1900, you've had an incredibly fast transformation. Most of the horse car lines are gone, a few remain. Most are gone though on electric traction is taking its place. This is kind of picture that shows you these various downtowns. There's an electric streetcar, there's a horse wagon, you know, other horse car vehicles. You get a sense of the difference in the way, how much space you have to put on the street, but also um, you fit their efficiency and so on. This is Liberty Avenue. Now, the point I want to make here at the end here is the way in which you began to find city streets increasingly crowded with more and more traffic of vehicles moving at a different speed. Vehicles moving, um, you'd be propelled by different sources of power. Um, horses, electricity, and what is that doing now? That was me. And this picture, which comes from the 1921 volume, I think is particularly illustrative of the competition that came to exist. Electric street car in the back, automobiles, gasoline or electric powered truck, and then a horse for a vehicle. <coughs> it's almost predictable from this, when you think about these different kinds of vehicles, the horse is going to become less and less important, but not completely irrelevant. And horses were going to be, may be maintained for a long period of time in certain kinds of um, situations that required frequent stops and slow delivery, like milk or bread and things like that. Um, the, from this picture, this is interesting. Um, six miles an hour for horses and 15 miles an hour for automobiles um, and trucks. Again, this is a kind of comparison between the truck and the, um, um, and, uh, the gasoline powered truck and the, um, and the horse drawn one. So, this is a picture that I can't fully figure out. I found this, this may have been in your book too, as a matter of fact, maybe not. And what, it says under it, it says a peddler. But I think they're collecting garbage here. <laughs> now, when I grew up in Jersey City, in the late 1940s, they were still using horse-drawn garbage trucks. And I think this looks like a garbage can. It doesn't look like, doesn't look like a peddler to me. And the horse is also a two-team two horse, two-team, two-horse team, and they're really those very powerful horses. 
friction lines or something like that. So if anybody knows the answer to that, I'd, I'd appreciate their help. Finally, pictures of a few of the remnants of the horse era around the city. This is a stable that I found in Troy Hill. And I was told that the, um, um, it served as a stable for Hipper Brewery. Um, this is a stable that exists on, on Butler Street in Lawrenceville. And I took that picture and then a couple of years later I came over and it had been it over and converted into an architectural studio. They cleaned the whole front up and of course you can make uh, do the clean up so you can see the horse head sticking up there in front. But just the other day I was told that this was the stable for the Pittsburgh Coroner. The Pittsburgh Coroner kept their horses here. So learn something all the time. Okay, that's that's it. Um, if you have any questions, you want to see any more, go back to any pictures, just give the word. Far away questions. Yes, ma'am? Well, aside from the horse truck that I mentioned, are there any remnants of, of horse uh, business in Sparrow Hill? Horse businesses? There are some stables. And um, uh, several people have told me about carriage houses and stables, and I haven't got any pictures of them yet, but that's basically what I think would be. But don't forget, Squirrel Hill develops quite late. It develops, um, it's in many, in many ways it's a suburb that is affected as much by the automobile. Uh, it's electric streetcar too, uh, but the automobile too. So there would be some horses, but you wouldn't necessarily find um, the extent of livery stables or work horses and so on. But I'm sure there were some you know, in the early 20th century. We can go through city, I've uh, gone through city directories, and go through city directories and figure out where they're located. And you can do it, it's possible to do it in that way. But there's a level of detail that I haven't gotten to yet. Okay. No. What is the horse truck that you're talking about? Where is that? Yeah. The horse, now there is a, the one that Esther was talking about. Yes. In the pub? Yeah. Um, where is that? You know where Homeless Cemetery is? Forbes, Forbes Avenue, across from the cemetery where Forbes comes very near Beachwood, there's a triangle of green. Mm -hmm. And it's on the Beachwood side, and it's there. And it's got flowers planted in it. But beside it is, is a water arrangement, it's Pittsburgh Water Company. Sure, sure. And I remember when it had water in it. Yeah. Yeah. There are actually is in other cities there are um, water cloths that have now been converted to flower, uses flowers and things like that. But they really were forbidden I mean, because they did have very big problems with transmission of disease. Yeah. Yeah. What were the regulations for cleaning up the new adopting the streets? Was the householder responsible for it or confronted him or was there? Was that the origin of street cleaning? Or? No, no, no. Well, the, streets, the, the street cleaning really originated very early on. The cities were conscious of that. But the householder was responsible for keeping the sidewalk in front of his house clean without the street necessarily. <clears throat> so I, um, basically they tried to do something about um, having streetcar companies, for instance, control their own door and so on. As long as it was a valuable commodity, it, you know, it, it was picked up, but once it became less valuable, then it became a big problem. In many cases, it was piled up also outside of the living stables because what they liked to do was season it. It was worth more as fertilizer for season. So you have these huge problems with smell. In New York City, there are a number of cases like that. I didn't find any in Pittsburgh, but I, I suspect there probably were some too. Now, one thing I didn't mention was the fact that the um, um, cruelty to animals, this is the, the society for, cruel, for prevention of cruelty to animals in Pittsburgh starts basically because of the concern over horses. And it's many books that have gone through and have quite a few descriptions of stables mistreated horses, and then they shipped over to children in the late 19th century. <laughs> you can worry about the treatment of children also. Well, another, another thing, in 1913, um, a, a group called the Municipal Bureau, um, the Reference Bureau was called into Pittsburgh to examine the efficiency of its, um, of its institutions, governmental institutions. And they found that in 1913, municipal horses, fire, police horses, were very badly treated and barely stable. So, um, and they, and they, so they began to clean these up after that. And 18, 1931, the city published a book 
focusing on the city's horses mm. and bragged about how well they were kept and what wonderful animals they were and so on. And just you, as they were going out? Uh, well, they did keep them around, you know, for, for police purposes, of course, for a long time. And an awful lot of, <clears throat> it's felt that um, mounted policemen were very effective in crowd control. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you know about the economics of uh, horses? And for example, what did a horse cost in comparison, say, to an automobile uh, today? Could a uh, middle class family afford a horse? No, you, you, there, was, there wasn't necessarily a cost of the horse as much as the cost of maintaining the horse in the city. Yeah. You know, it, it was very, in many cases, prohibitive. So not a lot of middle class people had horses. Um, you know, and you would find, um, then there's a the question about when you did put the stable in if you had one. Uh, you wanted to keep it as close to your house as you could because of, you know, convenient. But on the other hand, there are other, there are other reasons why you didn't want it too close. So if you look through all these guidebooks, there are many guidebooks that are published about <coughs> horses and carriages and keeping these up and so on. <coughs> they have different recommendations about that. I don't know, it, it seems to me that the price of horses varied over time depending upon um, the export demand, when it were you know, exported. At times they were imported, depending upon whether the streetcar companies were shifting over to electricity or not. So prices tended to go up and down. And during the 1890s, where we actually plotted out the changes in the price of horses, um, there was a depression and the price of horses went way down. But I, <clears throat> I think that, as far as we can see, you know, no city, be it the middle class individual, or, or some lower middle class, certainly, even middle middle class individuals have a horse. So if you were in business, you might have a horse, you know, for, for making deliveries and so on and so on. But it was a, it was an expense. So, you said that the horses on the horse fair is for blind? Yeah, they use What's blind horses a lot. Um, the, <laughs> blind horses are often used in manufacturing activities. Um, and they would get to go around in treadmills or horse wings or things like that. And um, blind horses also were in, were in the mines. In fact, horses become blind through their use in the mines. There are many, many blind horses in the mines. Mules, too. Yeah. And I'm wondering what would be the advantage of a horse being blind? I, I noticed your Wim Ferry has a circular wall up so the horses can't see that they're on the water. I assume that's, that's the reason that wall yeah, is... I never, I never, thank you, I, I hadn't noticed that, but um, they're, they're, so that they would not be along, but they just keep, you know, just become acculturated to the circular movement. Horses are very susceptible to noises, or the piece of paper flying, things like that, um, and so on. So, but if they were blind, they would be far more controllable. They wouldn't blind them deliberately, but blind horses were used extensively. Yeah. I'll just give you something too. You know those uh, delivery horses probably were wearing blinkers to keep them from panicking yeah, that's too. Yeah, that's blinkers that's just like a bit on a bit or right. Right. The, um, But I never use you see them in the horses down in yeah. Station Square and, yeah. uh -huh. um so I'm a middle class person, I'm going to delivery <coughs> stable. Do I rent by the <coughs> day? Um do I always get can I Take my pick of carriages or, um, yeah, you have a choice of type of carriage, how much you want to spend, if you want to rent a Chevrolet, you want to rent a Cadillac. I mean, you know, it's, pretty, <laughs> it's, a, it's your choice. And you, the, the different livery stables would also have different character vehicles and horses too. So there's a choice, you have a large choice. And, and you're <coughs> going to be for a long, more than three hours? Or, I don't know. Yeah. I suspect people would rent horses for a few, maybe a couple of weeks. Maybe for a day, you know. Maybe just for the funeral. How yeah. many of the inclines accommodated forces? Well, we do know that the um, uh, we have pictures actually of the um, of the um, Monongahela incline, when it had two two levels and carried horses and wagons as well as passengers. Um, I think there are several of them. I don't know the exact answer of how many. Um, accommodated horses and wagons as well as passengers, but not a, I should have just put less than majority of them, but some did. And depends upon what was the good. I mean, remember you had coal mining going on on top of Mount Washington, 
So there's a lot of poles going back and forth, and it was an advantage to you if you could just load your horse and wagon, um, take it down the incline, and take it up to where, wherever you wanted to go. But I don't think the um, Duquesne incline ever carried um, horses, for instance, of the two that we have left now. I've seen uh, pictures of a lot of other inclines, and I don't think I've seen one that could really show you the, the kind of um, the size and the capacity that the Menagerie Hill incline had. Yes? Um, I read somewhere that there's one building, I know of in Shadeside, that has a horse history. That's the Hunt Armory. They used to have horse shows there. As a sort of horse history. Well, I'm sure it was built in the late 19th century. It was built as reaction, one of the reactions to the railroad riots of 1877. You know, so there was, it was, it was in existence by that time. So I'm sure that they had horses stable there also. And if, of course, if you were going to put troops there, you would want to have cavalry there also. But what you were concerned with was disorder, civil disorder. But as I said, I'm struck by the. Um, the absence of um, information about the um, horses used by industry, though, I, sus I suspect there's a lot more. I've seen enough hints about it. But we know, I have um, the files of the National Steel Company for the late 19th century for their stables, how much they paid for their horses, how much they paid to feed them, and so on. But I'm sure that Carnegie, I have, I have letters from Andrew Carnegie, uh, he was buying horses but for himself, for elite use, but I don't have anything about Carnegie Steel. Somewhere there are those records if they've not been destroyed. We could learn a lot more. And the horses that they used, of course, for those purposes were much larger mammoth horses with great capacity. And there's a lot of horse breeding, too. They really worked very hard to try to breed the best horse, highest horsepower horse you could uh, you know, to do those various tasks. Take a couple more. Oh, that's yeah. Uh, one of the pictures you showed, I think it was at the Haymarket in uh, I, I Chicago. Haymarket, Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, the street was unpaved. Yeah, it was really muddy. Yeah, were most streets like that? And when did they start paving them? Well, they, they began paving really in the um, before the Civil War. Streets were paved. That's where they would do wooden paving, the pike roads, and, and wooden paving. Um, then they began to use. Um, um, Various kinds of, 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 of um, cobblestone was often used, but horses needed to have they had to go footing. You can still find cobblestone streets in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, there's one right at Murdoch Providence. It's a very steep it's cobblestone. Why is it cobblestone? There's a, there's a street in the Hill District on, on, the, on the west side of the hill, as you go down on the left side, that must have been put in, I'd say, probably about the 1870s. You know, it's all cobblestone. There's some on the north side that are still like that. And I have no doubt that they're there, that they're done like that, because to furnish better footing for horses as they either went down or up on the hill. They certainly didn't do it for automobiles, right? Or bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, my, my co author in the book, Clay McShane, who teaches in Boston. I've written a number of articles on the origins of streets and paving and so on. I'd be glad to give you the references if you're interested. The Cadam was another very popular kind of uh, um, um, street servicing um, material used, too. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Okay. wonderful speech tonight, originally prepared for us. Uh, you know we got a nice large crowd. We've been having nice large crowds. That's how I can get increasingly good speakers to come, because people like to talk to, to larger groups. And we've been able, for pretty consistently now, for three years, two years, to have over 30 people at every meeting. I just wanted to comment a little about a couple of related issues. The projector that we use tonight is now our own, thanks to folks buying our books, and over 3,000 have been sold. We have our, um, we, we now have our own projector. We have, we're building a video library. We have a problem with the video library. We don't have enough people around to really set it up in a way that we can use it, and we always need more volunteers, but we are building the library. Betty Conley, who's here, is slowly building an archives for this organization. 
Uh, but I just wanted to say, well, lots of good things are happening. Many people are coming. There are a lot of holes, too. We do not have enough bodies to sort of put out to the public a lot of the uh, things that we're beginning to gather. And, and Betty would be glad to get donations of additional items uh, from Squirrel Hill. But mainly, I want to thank many of you who keep coming every time. I think we, we do better and better, and it's the result of your participation, and it's much appreciated, and we will see you next month. I want to thank say, you. Um, thank you very much. If anybody um, has any pictures of horses or things like that, I'd be very interested in more information about the horse places around town. I really, I've done the beginning of my research in Pittsburgh, but I, there's a lot to be done. You know. Yeah, so I'd appreciate anything like that. And since you've sold over 3,000 copies of your book already, and I think I've sold just a few hundred of mine, maybe you want to take over the marketing. Yeah. <laughs> Ar Arcadia does that for us. We're not responsible. That's great.